Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we have a presentation today uh, from the Department of Entomology. And uh, uh, I'm going to ask the department head, uh, or acting department head, from the Department of Entomology to introduce the speakers. Uh, I have to say the speakers are dear to my heart. They're good friends of mine, so uh, it's very nice to see them again. And I know a little bit about their research. Uh, so I have seen a snip from their results. Uh, I think it's fascinating. So I'm looking forward to the presentation. Uh, Helandro, would you like to come and introduce the speakers? Thank, Thank you. you very much. So today I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pat Mackay, uh, senior scholar in our department, and so Dr. Bob Land, uh, a research scientist emeritus in agriculture and agriculture Canada. Um, they, um, they start the research collaboration, that's how they describe it, 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, where they coincide, I guess, at the uh, University of Toronto doing a bachelor in science. Then uh, they uh, both did a master in science in zoology at the University of Toronto. And after that, they did a PhD in ecology and agriculture at uh, uh, the University of British Columbia. They, after that, they did two years of postdoc, all of these coincidental, uh, at the University of Waterloo in uh, biology. And after that, um, they spent two years at the University of Wins uh, Windsor, um, but as a, an assistant professor, um, both as an adjunct, adjunct professor. Um, and after that, the quite unique opportunity arise in Winnipeg, two independent positions open up at the same time. Uh, one as a professor in the Department of Entomology, that uh, was the position that Pat applied successfully, and Bob got a position as research scientist in the Serial Research Center of Agriculture, uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And since that, they spent another 20 years or so collaborating and uh, specializing in different aspects of insect ecology, uh, but in particular work with physiological ecology of insects, particularly in aphids, um, and focusing on photoperiodism, dispersal, and effects of maternal age. And Bob worked with numerous insect pests in canola, peas, flax, wheat, uh, focusing on economic thresholds and management and was uh, instrumental in developing resistance to wheat mish in wheat. And uh, as a result of that, they have a very extensive publication record, uh, trained numerous students, participated in numerous um, graduate uh, committees, and uh, um, they have very extensive CVs that we're not going to go in any detail. <laughs> uh, a couple of things I pull out is that uh, um, Bob was recognized with the Entomological Society of Canada Gold Medal in 2002, and, um, and Pat was recognized by the Diamond Jubilee Medal of the Government of Canada in 2012 for her service to the country. Um, they continue to be very active members in the entomological community, both in Manitoba and Canada, and, um, and they provide uh, a lot of service and collaborations in our department participating in uh, lectures and in graduate committees. And uh, as any person that's highly educated and wise, they work in aphids. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see a little bit of that. Um, there will be other insects involved today as well. So thank you. Please uh, join me to welcome uh, Thank you, Ali. Um, well, Bob and I, for over 25 years uh, in Manitoba, have been studying various insects, pretty well all pests of crops, sometimes uh, from the point of view of control and sometimes just to try and understand them. Um, and uh, sometimes we've worked independently, mostly I guess since in Manitoba independently, and sometimes we've collaborated. But one of the things that has really struck us about all these insect pests that we've worked with, and over dinner frequently we would talk about it, is the huge variability in population levels among the insect pests. 
They're highly variable. They really seem very unstable. So why does instability matter? Um, it matters because of instability, we need to have good economic thresholds and we need to have good scouting in order to figure out what the levels of those insects are and whether they're going to need control. And if we don't do that, we waste pesticides, particularly in low years, uh, and it means that uh, that's bad for the environment and bad for the farmer's bottom line. So, Understanding instability would really help us to design better pest man management systems. Um, well, why are populations of crop pests so unstable? There are probably uh, lots of reasons, but some of them uh, that are important here is that many are accidentally introduced, and that means they're here without their predators. And the local predators are likely to be ill-adapted to them, at least initially. So there's a problem there. The other issue is uh, we grow our crops in these enormous monocultures. Uh, and we know that monocultures disrupt population processes. So to start, we're actually not going to start with a pest, uh, with a uh, crop species. We're going to start with a natural, uh, a native Insect, or a native plant, rather, uh, and a native insect that's a non-pest. The plant is this tall coneflower, which does, it's a native to Manitoba. It does really, really well in shade. We have a very heavily shaded garden at home, and so when we first arrived, we established some patches of uh, these plants in our garden and then left them alone. And in mid 19 uh, 90, about 1994, the mid-90s, we noticed for the first time this bright red aphid on this native plant. Now, this aphid, uh, Eurolucon rudbeckii, is uh, an aphid that only goes on this one species of plant, and this plant only has the one species of aphids, so it's quite a tight system. And when we first saw it, we'd start going out in the garden uh, after work or on the weekends, and we'd look at it and count it. So started making notes, uh, soon discovered that we were actually collecting data. <laughs> and we, we started to look at it in relation to the crop pests that we were working on throughout the week. And we came up with uh, what we referred to as a working hypothesis. We're dealing with these um, uh, pest insects that are up and down, up and down, and we, dis we thought that native species on naturally distributed host plants would have more stable populations than crop pests. So we used that to drive our work on this. So what we're going to do today is I will introduce you to Eurolocon rudbeckia and its population dynamics. And then Bob will take over and he'll quantify the stability of Eurolucon rudbeckii and test that working hypothesis. He'll then continue to describe some collaborations that we've used to investigate that population uh, stability, the idea of population stability. And then I'll come back right at the end and explore one factor affecting population stability of Eurolucon rudbeckii. So first of all, the um, the plant and the insect. This is tall coneflower emerging in the spring. Very quickly, uh, aphid eggs hatch and the aphids uh, get to the plants and infest them. Early in the season, uh, they're very low down on the plant stems as the uh, basal leaves are expanding. Um, but very soon, the plant bolts to flower stems and the aphids very quickly move up the flower stems and feed for the rest of the season at the growing tip and under the, uh, the growing flowers, and then uh, buds producing seed. At this time of year, uh, the aphids are entirely parthenogenetic. There are no males, so they don't need to mate, uh, and they don't uh, produce eggs. They bear their young alive. Uh, and at this time of the season, in the summer, uh, primarily, it will take 10 days for the aphid to go from birth 
to adulthood. And then once it's an adult, it begins to reproduce uh, very rapidly, producing maybe a maximum of 10 young a day for somewhere between 10 and 20 days to a total of about 100 young over its lifetime. So you can see that they can get very big, very, the populations can get very big very quickly. Oops, wrong button. Uh, at this time of year, uh, there are two adult morphs. There are non-winged aphids, the, those are the adults that you see there, uh, that could walk as far as the next plant stem, but not very much further than that. But if this plant begins to suffer, perhaps because of too many aphids, or perhaps because of drought, something like that, then these adults begin to produce young that are going to grow up to have wings, and those aphids can fly away to somewhere where conditions are better. Um, in any colony that you find, you can see all the life stages and often all of the morphs. So there's four juvenile instars, first instar, second instar, third, and then finally fourth instar uh, that will molt to an adult. Uh, and you can tell winged and non-winged from the third instar, actually. This one's going to be non-winged. This one, when it molts next, is going to be winged. You can see the shoulder pads here, which will turn into, the once it molts, the um, functional wings of an adult. But none of those life stages are cold hardy. Uh, and so with a the frost, they would die. Uh, so they wouldn't be able to overwinter here in Manitoba. So they've got to do something else. And what they do is parthenogenetically, um, they produce egg-laying females and males. These mate. And then once mated, the female walks off the plant down onto the uh, litter below the, the plant and lays her eggs. Those eggs are cold hardy and overwinter. Well, the work that we've done with this aphid, um, a lot of it is in the garden where we have four patches and we sample weekly. For some things that we do, we sample daily, but we sample weekly, uh, particularly for the data you'll get today. Uh, but we worried right from the beginning that maybe we were just studying the artifacts of a city garden. So right away, we went up to Riding Mountain National Park, where the plant uh, forms a, an important part of the understory in many areas, and particularly along some of the trails, you get uh, big populations of tall coneflower. And there we sampled initially twice a season, um, and more recently, just once a season. Uh, so here's in Winnipeg, our garden, Winnipeg home in the uh, south of the city, and in Riding Mountain National Park, two trails on the north side and two trails on the east side of the park. Our sampling programs are very straightforward. They're totally non-destructive. We count the plants. Uh, we search them for aphids, uh, count the number of aphids, the stages, the morphs, and if there's any evidence of predation. Uh, it's a perfect system for aging bodies because you don't even have to bend over to collect your data. Uh, and in fact, sometimes the plants are too tall for me. So let's look at uh, some of the data that we've been collecting. We'll start with aphid abundance, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, measured as mean number of aphids per stem up the y-axis over a range of years. And you can see uh, we expected it to be uh, fairly stable. You can see it doesn't really look fairly stable. Uh, it's sort of all over the map. Uh, we can look at that data. But this is from one day in the second half of August. Uh, you don't need to know why we chose that, but it's important to the biology. Uh, but we also, in the city, measured uh, throughout the season. And here you see seasonal abundance, still mean number of aphids per stem. And two things to get from uh, this, it's six years all on top of one another. The peak moves back and forth through the season, and the peak moves up and down from one year to the next. Um, 
now I need to introduce a couple of new terms. Uh, the terms are prevalence and intensity. These are two parameters um, that you can divide abundance into, and we have Terry Galloway to thank for uh, providing us with these. Terry uh, works in parasitology, is an ectoparasitologist, and um, the, ex the parasitologists have been using these two parameters for a long time, and it gives you quite a bit of power. Uh, prevalence is the proportion of hosts that are infected or infested, and intensity is the mean number of uh, organisms per infected host, so you, or infested host, so you, you ignore the zeros for intensity. Um, so for our aphids, uh, abundance, as I've already shown you, is the mean number of aphids per stem. Prevalence is the proportion of stems, flowering stems, with aphids. And intensity is the mean number of aphids per infested stem. And that means that prevalence times intensity, both conceptually and numerically, equals abundance. And it gives you a lot of power over exploring um, population processes. So let's, for one year, divide the um, abundance curve that was one of the six uh, into intensity and prevalence. And you can see that these two parameters peak at totally different times. Intensity in this case, this particular year, in t uh, peaked in the spring. Prevalence quite late in the season. Um, and if we multiplied those two curves together, we'd get the abundance curve. Um, they're not always as well separated as that, but uh, uh, they're often right on top of one another. So what we want to do now is look at the relationship between abundance and uh, its two components, prevalence and intensity. So this first one is excuse me, peak prevalence along the x-axis and peak abundance up the y. And you can see that there's a, a nice relationship there. And we log transformed it, and we get even a tighter relationship, a, a highly significant relationship. Um, we can do the same thing with uh, mean intensity, peak mean intensity. And it looks initially like we have the same kind of relationship here. But there's a, prob oops, there's a problem. Those two points. Uh, are actually two years where prevalence was one. Every single stem was infested. Um, and if prevalence equals one, by definition, abundance equals in mean intensity. And so we think it's not very useful in trying to track a relationship between those two parameters. And if you don't have those two, you don't have a relationship between uh, abundance and mean intensity. But you might wonder about dropping two out of nine points. This is uh, data from nine years. <coughs> so I'd like to show it to you in a different way, which I think will convince you of, it, of the legitimacy of that. We're back looking at prevalence again, how many stems are infested. But instead of looking at just abundance, we're looking at, at again, day of the year for peak abundance. And what you see here is that uh, when prevalence is high, the peak uh, is very early in the season. And when prevalence is low, the peak is very late in the season. And that's a highly significant relationship. If we do the same thing with the same data for peak mean intensity, there is no relationship. We think it's prevalence, the number of stems that are infested, that's driving abundance, and not the size of the colonies. OK, uh, so I want to go back then to what we did initially and look at um, the numbers over the season. I'm sorry, over a range of years. And so I've broken the very first graph I showed you into uh, its components, abundance into its components of prevalence and mean intensity. And you can see that prevalence looks very much like abundance in that it's all over the place, whereas mean intensity is much less unstable, more stable perhaps. And with that in mind, I'm going to pass things over to Bob. If, I, if I start coughing, Pat will just take over. 
So what do we mean by stability? Uh, I think intuitively uh, we might agree that uh, a population with more and uh, more extreme fluctuations in abundance is less stable than one, than one that doesn't have very many fluctuations. So high temporal variability in uh, pop population size means that the population is unstable and low temporal variability means that it's stable. Well now we need a way to quantify stability and 30 years ago what people did was use the standard deviation simple statistical uh, characteristic of uh, populations uh, of, of the mean, uh, the variation in the mean. They used the standard deviation of log abundance uh, to quantify stability. It doesn't work because standard deviation depends upon the mean. So people started using coefficient of vari variation. These are usually theoretical studies, not, uh, not hands-on uh, research with organisms. But there are good reasons why that isn't a good metric as well. So we've started using uh, a metric called PV. Uh, PV is just short for an acronym for population variability. And it was developed by Joel Heath uh, when he was a graduate student at Simon Fraser University in, in BC. I won't go into detail on how it's calculated, but it's really quite simple. It's, it's a mean, it's the mean of the, all of the differences between all annual abundances in a time series. That's how you calculate it. You don't really need to follow that. Uh, but the important thing about it is that it's a proportion between zero and one, and estimates of PV are normally distributed. Uh, and that's important when it comes to doing the statistical analyses. And I didn't put it on here, but it's also important that it can be used with a distribution of any sort. It doesn't have to be normally distributed. So when we're using this to measure stability, have to remember that a high PV means that the population is unstable, and a low PV means that it's stable. So let's go back to our working hypothesis that Pat showed you. So we're expecting our native population of aphids on naturally distributed host plants to have more stable populations than crop pests. Well, now we can measure uh, this uh, stability with this PV, and it turns out that this aphid has a, a PV of 0.72 on a range of between 0 and 1. So that doesn't really look that stable. And if we look at the two components of stability, uh, of abundance, prevalence and mean intensity, you can see that the uh, PV for prevalence is 0.63, quite high, and that matches our in intuition that this uh, uh, prevalence is unstable and mean intensity has a PV of 0.38 uh, more or less in sync with with the relatively low uh, variation so PV looks like it's doing the job we want it to do <clears throat> and so those are the estimates of PV that for our species uh, but what about pests well, we were quite a few years into this study when we realized that life is short. We have PV for one species, but it's, a, it's not a crop pest. And no one else has measured uh, stability in this way for any crop pests. So we needed to do something. We, we don't have many more 20 years uh, to measure uh, population variability in pests. And to be perfectly honest, we have other things to do in life as well. So uh, the solution was, uh, and this was Pat's solution, was 
We've got to collaborate. We've got to write to people, other researchers, who, who have the data uh, collected over long periods of time, you, always for other reasons, but would those people send us their data? <coughs> Excuse me. And let us have a look at it. Well, <coughs> people were enthusiastic in sending us their data. So the first one, oops, sorry was Andriali Olkin at the University of Maine, then David Wool <coughs> at the University of Tel Aviv, Guy Boivin with Agriculture Canada in Quebec, Terry Galloway here in um, uh, entomology, and then Alejandro Costa Magna and Jordan Bannerman also here in entomology. So I'm going to tell you about uh, these collaborations. This is the first one with uh, uh, Aliokan and, and Maine, and these are the PVs uh, we estimated for these three aphid species, all living on potatoes. Uh, and then here's another one. This is, I love the name of this aphid, Bizongia pistachii. It's a galling aphid. It makes the, a gall that looks like a banana on wild uh, pistachio trees. Uh, that are native in Israel. And uh, David Wall had 20 years of data on the numbers of these galls. And uh, this, uh, pop these populations have a PV of 0.58. So we now have uh, two species, our Eurolucon rebeccii. We call them living in a natural habitat. And the same is true for Bizongia pistachii. And then we have the three potato aphids, uh, which are clearly crop pests. Well, uh, they completely overlap. There's no, uh, we can't, certainly can't conclude that the natural uh, populations are more stable than the crop pests. But here are some other examples. Here are the uh, two natural populations of aphids again. Here are five. Uh, vegetable crop pests from southern Quebec and in fact most of their PVs are lower than the uh, natural populations of the aphids. So our hypothesis, our worth, working hypothesis has to be rejected. Uh, we've got a number of examples that clearly show that crop pests have the same level of instability or even less instability than these natural populations we've studied. Admittedly, not many populations, but certainly a number. So uh, where do we go from there? Well, we've got collaborations now uh, <clears throat> that include data on 38 species. And so perhaps we can learn uh, why population uh, stability vary so much among these species by looking at the results from these collaborations. <clears throat> well, let's go back to those potato aphids again, because to make these comparisons, we have to understand uh, how precise these estimates of PV are, and particularly how many years of data you require to uh, estimate PV uh, precisely. Uh, we've been doing it for 20 years. Maybe we could have stopped after five years or 10 years. I mean, it's been fun, but how many more years are we going to keep going? So uh, we went to these uh, potato aphid data because it's such a remarkable uh, set of data. Over 60 years of continuous counting of the abundance of potato aphids. So what we did was divide the, the time series, these 60-year time series, into short time series, a three-year time series. So we have 23-year time series in these 60 years of data, or four 15-year time series. And then we just calculated a mean PV from those short time series, uh, replicated short time series, 
and we calculated the standard deviation. This is all very easy uh, statistics. And then uh, we use simple t-tests to look at the differences in PV among those three species. How well could we distinguish the PVs that those three species uh, exhibited? Well, let's first look at the standard deviation of PV for two of the species. So if standard deviation of PV on this y-axis and the length of the time series, the intervals of years. So there's a three-year time series and up to a 20-year time series. And what you see is that the standard deviation declines with the longer the, longer the time series is. And, but it levels off at 15 to 20 years. The same is true for that third aphid species, but there was this little quirk here at 20 years. We, it took us a while to figure out why that rose after 20 years, but we did, and it's a, it is really a quirk. In fact, this species, uh, it levels off also between 15 and 20 years. So then we took those standard deviations and means, and we did the t-test, and uh, I'm going to give you an example here. So we've got uh, misclassifications. What I mean by that is uh, MP, Mises persicae, has a PV of 0.78 over 60 years. Aphis nasturti has a PV of 0.84 over 60 years. How many times do you get this difference wrong if you have a short time series? with a simple t-test. Well, in fact, you misclassify that difference 50% of the time with shorter time series. But once you get to 15 years of data, you make no misclassifications when you do the test. And the same is true at 20. And the same is true uh, for the other two species. So we know that the standard deviation of PB reaches a minimum at about 15 years, and PVs are correctly ranked in relation to each other in comparisons at 15 years. So with a 15-year time series, uh, differences in PV of 0 0.06 units uh, reliably tell you that the PVs are different between two species. So that's 6% of the total range. Remember, PV is, has a range of 0 to 1. So 0 0.06 is 6% of that. So um, <clears throat> you can use that number in the subsequent uh, uh, results I'll show you to tell whether the PV of two species are different or not. So uh, we wanted to know why PV varies uh, among species. And we came up with, I mean, we, we had to have some questions to begin this sort of a study. So the questions we started with were, is PV a species-specific trait? In other words, do different species have different PVs just because they're different species? Uh, is PV adapted to environmental fluctuations? Maybe it all depends on, how, on the severity of the fluctuations in the environment. And is PV higher in common than in rare species? I'll tell you later why we came up with that hypothesis. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, if, species, if PV is a species-specific trait, then species in the same <coughs> habitat, subject to the same environmental fluctuations, may still have different PVs. Even though the environment is varying just the same amount for them, their PVs may be different. And also, uh, if it's a species-specific trait, related species may have more similar PVs than unrelated ones. Uh, the thinking here is that uh, leg length, if you're a taxonomist and uh, you measure leg length, you expect species that are closely related to have more similar leg lengths than species that are more distantly related. So maybe the same is true for uh, stability or PV. 
Well, let's look at some of the data from these collaborations. Going back to those uh, potato aphids, here's uh, the three species growing on the same potatoes in the same plots for 60 years, and clearly they have different PVs. In fact, all three of these PVs are statistically different. So that's consistent with our view that PV is a species-specific trait. <clears throat> Here's an example from Terry Galloway's work on bird lice. Uh, on uh, pigeons in this case. Um, and you can see that this species, uh, they're all living on the same birds, so certainly they're getting the same environmental fluctuations. Uh, this species has a lower PB than these three, and this one, Hohorstiella, has a higher PB than the other three. So again, species specific. And here are two uh, <coughs> uh, carrot pests living on the same carrots in the same plots in Quebec and clearly oh, clearly a very different PV between these two species. What about uh, whether or not related species have similar PVs? <clears throat> well here are three Delia species. These are three flies that are uh, pests of vegetable crops in Quebec. We have uh, some of them here as well. And you can see they're in the same genus, they're close related, and sure enough, their PVs are remarkably similar. And uh, here's the exception. Of course, it's never as tidy as you want. Here's data for five lady beetle species in the genus Hippodamia. These uh, four species have relatively similar PVs, but Hippodamia parenthesis clearly quite a bit lower than the others. So not all species that are close related have the same PV. Is PV adapted to environmental fluctuations? Well, if so, we expect higher PV in introduced species than in native ones because the introduced species haven't had time to adapt to the native, uh, to the environmental fluctuations in their new habitat, or at least perhaps that's the case. And also, if it's adapted, uh, PV is adapted, then we expect that PV will decline the longer the time the species has been in a new habitat. So back to these boring, well, not so boring, potato aphids. One of them, fortunately, was native. And two of them are introduced. And sure enough, the native species adapted to this environment has a much lower PV than the two introduced species. <clears throat> or the carrot weevil and the carrot rust fly living in the same environment. Uh, carrot weevil is native, carrot rust fly is, is from Europe, and sure enough, the carrot weevil has a much lower PV. It is a much more stable population. And does PV decline? as uh, an introduced species adapts to its new environment? Well, uh, we got at this by, well, first, these are the carrot pests, and this may be a bit small for the people in the back. On this axis, we have the measurement of PV, and on this axis, we have uh, the time series divided into three segments, early, middle, and late. And the black bar is the introduced species, and the gray bar is the native one. And you can see that as time goes by, PV declines for the introduced species. Uh, that's for the carrot pest. Lady beetles with uh, Costa Magna and Bannerman, in that case, uh, uh, same thing, population variability. This bar represents four introduced species of lady beetle, and uh, this bar, the nine, uh, native lady beetle species, and sure enough, the PV declines the longer the uh, introduced species are present in their new environment. Finally, is PV higher in common than in rare species? And the rationale for this question is that uh, 
you might expect this to be the case, and theoreticians 20 years ago working on this did expect that uh, PV would be higher in common than in rare species. And that's simply because the standard deviation, a measure of variation, uh, depends upon the mean. So standard deviation is higher if the mean is higher. And therefore, uh, they, uh, the theoreticians expected that this would follow for population variability as well. But as far as we can tell, there's no clear ecological basis for this prediction. It's a statistical expectation. So we looked at that for these 13 species of lady beetles again. <clears throat> so here's population variability, and these are the PV estimates for each of the 13 species. And on this axis is the log of the abundance of those species. And what we see, in fact, is that the common species have relatively low PV, and the rare species have high PV. So why does PV vary among species, at least in the ways, the three ways that we've chose to look at it? Is it a species-specific trait? Well, apparently, yes. Is PV adapted to environmental fluctuations? Again, yes. Is PV higher in common than in rare species? Well, a clear no, at least for lady beetles. And uh, in fact, it's the other way around. Common species of lady beetles have more stable populations than rare ones. And this is probably quite important in understanding uh, the uh, dynamics of these species. But we've only got 38 species uh, that we've been able to work with so far. We're working with others now, but we need a lot more species to uh, confirm these hypotheses. So with that, I'm going to turn back to Pat, who's going to tell you about how we've been using these same ideas to help us understand uh, PV and Eurolucon. There. OK. So um, we've come back to our, our aphid, our lovely red aphid. Uh, and we're going to look at one aspect of it to try and understand what might be driving PV more specifically than we could see in, in uh, the information that Bob was presenting. First, I want to go back and put you back in, uh, in the center of Eurolucon work. Uh, this was the abundance graph that you saw right at the beginning, um, uh, mean aphids per stem. And you can see that the PV is 0.72. And then we took that and we broke it down into its two components, uh, prevalence on the top and um, mean intensity on the bottom. And what we thought was happening proves to be correct in relation to PV. Um, prevalence has a high PV, 60.63, not that different from 0.72, whereas mean intensity is down at 0.38. So mean intensity, um, the mean number of aphids on a plant, an infested plant, is relatively stable. And we think we know why. Um, let's look at um, peak mean intensity for 949 colonies. A lot of the graphs you were seeing before were using nine years of data. This, these are the 949 colonies from those nine years. And we're looking at um, peak mean and peak colony size here, which is not just another way of saying peak aphid intensity. Uh, and it's a frequency diagram, so it's uh, the percent of the 949 colonies up the y-axis. And you only need to look at the first bar, which represents um, all the colonies that had 50 or fewer aphids. You can see that the vast majority um, 80% of the colonies had 50 or fewer aphids. And you may or may not remember that I told you that a reproducing aphid um, can have 10 young a day. Uh, so in five days, a female might have 50 young with her. Uh, so this could be just five days worth of effort. Could be. Let's look at the same data for colony longevity for the, the same 949 colonies. Uh, 
we sampled weekly. So this is a frequency diagram of the number of weeks that colonies survived. And you can see that um, over 35% of all of these colonies were present only in one sample day. Uh, and a further 20%, so a total of 55% for the two together, um, a further percentage were present only in two sample days. Um, so these colonies could be between one and six days old. Colonies here could be between uh, seven and 13 days old. You'll remember, so with those two together, 13 days or fewer that the colonies existed. You'll remember that I said uh, that it takes 10 days to go from birth to adulthood. So the vast majority of these two columns together, 55% uh, of those colonies, never managed to produce an adult. These colonies were very, very short-lived. Well, we think we know the reason that they were so short-lived. And here we're looking at predator prevalence. So up the y-axis is the uh, percent of colonies that had any evidence of predation from, zero, uh, from 20 to 100 percent. And that first point there, we're now looking at one year worth, 230 aphid colonies. 82 of the 230 colonies were present in only one sample day. They came and they were gone. And of those 82, about 25 percent of them already have predators in them. If we go to the second point, 43 colonies lasted for two sample days, were present in, in two uh, subsequent weeks. And at the point of the, that one, 60 percent of those the 43 colonies had predators in them. And it took only five weeks, any, any colony that lasted for five weeks and any colony thereafter had 100% of them had predators in them. And not necessarily just one predator. There were colonies that we looked at that could have up to four different predators in them simultaneously. Moreover, we looked at those colonies for about 15 minutes a week, a single colony. There was a whole lot of the week there that other predators could have been coming into those colonies. Um, so the, the predators are getting in there really fast and they're taking out a lot of the small colonies and they're there in numbers in the larger colonies. So just a quick look at uh, the kinds of predators that we were finding. Um, parasitism was the most common. Oops, sorry. Pred uh, parasitism was the most common. Over uh, almost 35 percent of all colonies had predators in them. Um, but I don't want to talk about them because it's kind of a complicated story. But the more straightforward ones, hoverflies, spiders, midges, lacewings, notice that lady beetles is right at the bottom. Only maybe 2% of these colonies had lady beetles in them. And yet lady beetles are usually considered the most significant predator of aphids. Uh, we have no idea why they don't like our aphids. Um, but we just wanted to show you a few of the aphids that come into our colonies and some of the drama that we watch. Uh, this is one of our native lady beetles. It's there rarely, but this is Anatus eating one of our adults. Uh, here's another lady beetle. This is a larva, uh, also eating one of our aphids. This is the Asian multicolored lady beetle, and it's really been uh, coming into our garden, uh, I think, for about the last four or five years. Uh, but it's getting more frequent, uh, uh, more numerous every year. Uh, here's the adult of the Asian multicolored, also eating one of our aphids. Um, but this is the predator that is probably otherwise uh, the most important. This is a hoverfly. Uh, the non-entomologists might think this is a wasp, but it's not. It's, it's a fly. And the adult doesn't feed on aphids. It just feeds on um, the products from, uh, from flowers, nectar, maybe pollen. But it will fly down below 
uh, and lay eggs in any aphid colony. So you can see two little white dots up here. Those are unhatched hoverfly eggs. Here are two more eggs that have just hatched and the maggots have come out and are immediately feeding. They didn't even move away from their eggshell before they grabbed an aphid. Here's a third one in this colony down here, um, uh, the next instar on, probably of the same species. We have a half a dozen different species of, of, uh, surf, of uh, hoverflies in, in our uh, aphids. And these aphids on this one would look like this when they're adults, uh, or not adults, I'm sorry, uh, when they're finished feeding and they're about ready to pupate. Um, and that, that maggot has lived in that aphid colony for its entire life and when it would get hungry it would just reach over and grab an aphid. <laughs> you might think aphids are not all that smart. You might be right. Um, here's another uh, fly that comes into our colonies. This is a tiny little midge and these are two maggots that are just finishing up on this aphid and I think they're about ready to pupate. Uh, this is probably their last meal and you can see they're leaving corpses all over the colony. They make an awful mess of an aphid colony. Lacewings are another important predator. Uh, you at the back probably can't see it, but lacewing larvae, uh, this is a brown lacewing, uh, they have uh, mandibles that are hollow and when they find a prey item they just ram those mandibles in and suck back. So here you can see um, two first instars here, a couple more there, and on the mandibles of this lacewing is uh, the remains of a sucked out first instar aphid, poor thing, nothing left. The, uh, the brown lacewing adults also feed on aphids, and uh, here's a shot of one poor aphid trying to get away slowly <laughs> as, as fast as it can while the uh, lacewing adult just takes bites out of its back end and you can see the red all over its face. Um, it was a tragic race. Uh, spiders, much to our surprise, turned out to be very important predators um, in our system. That may look to you like a little aphid just sitting there. It's not. It's on its back. If you came up close, you could see that. It's on its back and you can see a little bit of red goo on the mouth parts of this spider. And you can see all the sisters of this aphid up in the flower head. They were down around here and now they're up in the flower head hoping that the spider can't get in among the developing seeds. Uh, or then there's this spider. We have, I, I, we haven't counted recently the number of spiders that attack our aphids. This one has wrapped up maybe half a dozen of uh, our maybe second instar uh, larvae into silk there for a later meal. So a ton of predators in there really fast. And our conclusion about this, and we've only uh, given up working on uh, population variability and started working on 20 years of predator data uh, relatively recently. Uh, but our conclusion is that predation stabilizes uh, mean intensity by limiting the size of most colonies. So that you get that greater stability in uh, mean intensity uh, because the small colonies are disappearing very rapidly and the larger colonies are being pulled back all the time by these predators. And this of course begs our next question. Uh, which we haven't even started to think about seriously, and that is, why doesn't predation stabilize prevalence as much? Why is, the, is prevalence uh, so unstable by comparison? And we, we haven't, uh, we don't know where we're going with that one. But, in conclusion, um, we have quantified stability for Eurolucon rudbeckii and 37 other species. And we've used those 38 species to begin evaluating some general hypotheses about stability and how it varies. And we've used Eurolucon rudbeckii to begin exploring the ecological details, the ecological factors affecting stability. And with that, if there's enough time, we'd be happy to answer questions.
very much for an interesting presentation, lovely photos, brilliant. Uh, are there any questions for Pat and Bob? Yes. Uh, do you think the 15 year window to capture the PV might change with increasing climate change and that, that affects fluctuations? Um, I think. I would think that um, the number of years might vary with what PV is. So that the higher PV, the more years you might need to get it to stabilize. So on a very, very stable organism, maybe it would stable, uh, become more stable sooner. Yeah, I think sooner. that's right. If climate change should increase the instability, I would think and therefore in a currently stable species, you might need more years. But I think the bigger effect would be the increasing variability that the organism hadn't experienced before, and therefore increasing, perhaps, uh, instability. Neil. Did you always sample the same number of flower stems? And do flower stem numbers vary? Because the prevalence times intensity that uh, means different things if you have more or less stems. I work with Pat. We sample every flower stem. <laughs> <laughs> does the number vary much from here? Uh, uh, yes, but it bears no relationship to the prevalence or the uh, in instability. It's, it's, we were quite surprised by that. Uh, do you have any hypotheses as to why the lady beetles weren't as common uh, predators in your gardens? We are really puzzled by that. The, the native one, we only see um, when the larvae are very big or the adults have emerged, and, and we think it's mostly up in the trees, uh, and then the lar they're dropping down sometimes you know, as, as the numbers of aphids in the trees decline. Um, uh, the um, Asian multicolored is a totally different issue, and I think it's going to become quite a common predator in our garden. But why the na even C7, uh, which is not native, um, rarely, rarely do we see it in the garden, and we never, s in Riding Mountain, I think we have never seen a lady beetle of any species on our plants. We see them in Riding Mountain, but they're not coming to our plants, so I don't know why. Maybe our aphid just tastes really bad. <laughs> No We're egg. afraid of you, Pat. That's right. Yes. No, no egg has ever been laid. No lady beetle egg has ever been laid in one of our colonies. Well, um, uh, the Asian multicolored is laying egg now. Last year we had yeah, eggs laid. Last, last year was the first, first time. time. But in other species of aphids on other plants in the garden, we're following many, not closely, but many other species of aphids on other plants. There would be fine lady beetle eggs all the time. Hmm. Yeah. So, like stability of population dynamics influenced by so many factors like temperature, breeding humidity, and also like predator. Do you have a think about any relationship between your like your PV values and yearly effect sample the months and temperature you know, during the time? Do you have this think about that one? Um. Well, it must be. Uh, variation in, in uh, abiotic factors like temperature or precipitation that drives the um, uh, fluctuations. I'm, I'm sure. I think that's what you're you're implying. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, we thought that would be the case, and most people think that mm -hmm. should be the case. But um, if that is primarily uh, the primary factor. Why do two species living on the same plant in the same spot uh, with these experiencing exactly the same precipitation uh, and temperature from year to year? Why can one of them have a PV that is half that of the other? And the uh, what we think is happening is that these species are actually adapting to the environmental variation mm -hmm. 
that they're experiencing. And through evolution, they're putting it anthropomorphically. They're devising strategies. They're adapting in ways that limit the uh, amount of variation in their populations. So PV is an adapted trait of these species. That's, that's our theory. Jason. I'm going to ask a similar question, but in a completely opposite way. I was, I was watching a, a YouTube video about uh, something called the Fighting Bombs Constant. It's a weird mathematical thing. And just by a very simple mathematical model, we have sort of initial sort of population size, and you just change the rate of growth. You can go from sort of that one sort of stable peak to two peaks to four peaks, and it's and just by that changing the rate of growth, mm -hmm. destabilize the pattern. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering whether or not there's any information on the rate of growth that's typical of these species, whether or not that relates to the very We need we need more PVs, and we need PVs of um, different. Um, patterns of growth organisms. So, uh, there, are there estimates of what like, is the typical rate of growth, like birth minus death for any species? Some of uh, I mean, the aphids have many, many generations per year. So, that, I mean, the rate of growth birth to adult is 10 days. Uh, many of these other species. But the death rate must be really high, too. Pardon me? But the death rate must be really high as well. Well, yeah, well. otherwise we'd be up to our own. <laughs> Pat would be very happy. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe another way of uh, getting at that would be in two of the lady beetles uh, that uh, we've, I've looked at with uh, Ali and Jordan in the entomology. Uh, w one of them is uh, C7 and the other is uh, um, well, the Asian multicolored. And, and uh, they both have exactly the same PV, or very, very close. And uh, C7, oh, this is over 23, 23 years? Yeah, 23 years. Uh, C7 cycles, same, same life history, eating the same aphids, uh, mostly. C7 cycles, the population goes up and down, very regular. Uh, Asian multicolored, it's, there's no cycles, it's all over the map. Both introduced beetles, but they have exactly the same PV. So it's not, there's nothing simple about the rate of development or the, uh, uh, that's causing these differences. Uh, though the things that you're talking about helps explain why you see cycles, regular cycles. But it doesn't explain why you get uh, higher or lower variability. Uh, what, go, oh, why, why not? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you have if you have a species that cycles, it goes up and has like a four cycle. That would be. Yeah, it it, um, it still goes up and down. Yeah. Uh, and no one, th this is getting into an area where no one has. Uh, yet worked, uh, and I'd like to on the, on the quantitative side, but I haven't got there yet, partly because I don't know how, is uh, in fact that we say those two lady beetles that I was using in this, as an example have the same PV, the same level of stability. Well, in fact, I don't think they do, because the one that cycles, I know exactly where it's going to be three years from now. So I would like to figure out how to get that uh, uh, cyclicity out and measure PV. And I, I don't know how to do that. But somebody will figure it out. Well, it's uh, time. Uh, any further questions? You have to go for dinner with them. So, uh, <laughs> one more round of applause. Uh,